they straight away abide as the self, capital S, capital E, capital L, capital F, aka the soul. And take the three last breaths of your life and right now. I will be talking about reincarnation in the Akashic field, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to learn these things that I've learned. Uh, I went really deep, and I took it personally, or transpersonally, as, as you'll see. Um, so what am I going to be talking about um, is generally present you uh, an art the main article that I read by a guy called Christopher Bach. Everybody have a handout? Yeah. Everybody feeling good? Um, Christopher Bach is a teacher at the uh, California Institute of Integral Studies, so he's very influenced by Ken Wilber and that whole thing. And he's also been influenced by Stanislav Grof, who kind of uh, did work with, he's called one of the fathers of uh, transpersonal psychology. He's been working with um, non-ordinary states of consciousness and cataloging them in the 70s and 80s. He worked with maybe thousands of patients um, with all kinds of psychedelic and therapeutic work. Um, so that's Christopher Bach, he's now teaching in multiple universities and giving lots of uh, lectures, but most of his knowledge, I read also two of his books, Life Cycles and uh, Dark Knight, Early Dawn, which are about this subject. Um, and he did a lot of work himself with psychedelics and uh, uh, therapeutic work. He's not exactly mentioning how he did it, and so I don't know what substances he took or under what circumstances, but I do know that he, um, he did a or, or at least over a, a long period of time, two and a half decades. Um, this article is talking about uh, reincarnation with, uh, as a conversation with the idea of Akashic field, which I will define shortly. Um, and, the, and so it's a dialogue with Irvin Laszlo, not a real dialogue, but just a, kind of an academic dialogue. And Irvin Laszlo, um, just real quick, is a very famous scientist. Most of you probably heard the name, um, kind of an elder in the scientific com community. And he's, um, he's done work in just making an integral theory of everything in science, uh, from systems theory to evolutionary biology and quantum physics and stuff like that. And he really uh, is one of the people who coined the terms Akashic field as it uh, comes to physics. But Akasha came from, uh, from before, it's a uh, uh, Sanskrit term. Anyway, I'll get to it. So, Yeah, so I'll just present the, the paper that is a conversation between uh, uh, reincarnation and the Akashic field and whether the idea of Akashic field is making the idea of soul or reincarnation not needed so much. And then we're going to look at some ways we can um, uh, promote a shifting of the paradigm when we're talking about uh, these concepts. Then we're going to take a little sidetrack and explore other avenues of what might be uh, possible in the after life realm. And, um, and then we'll return and get to some nice conclusion um, that is integrated conscious transcendence as just a practical uh, practice that we can take from here and perhaps uh, use the rest of the breaths that we have in this life to cultivate if we choose. Um, so I just want to th thank Hart very much for being my partner in this uh, inquiry and providing really good reflection and feedback. So I'll start with uh, reincarnation as a field of study is how does one, because we're talking here about like third person approaches to study or first person, well, reincarnation is something that is beyond this life um, by definition, so it's hard a little bit to, you know, how do we gain information about it? So I'll, um, I'll just mention a few of the, the ways to gain information about uh, reincarnation, and that is out of body experiences and near death experiences, people come back from the truthful experience of them and just report back. Uh, the wisdom tradition, the um, um, Tibetan Book of the Dead and Chinese um, ancient philosophy and shamanic uh, ad ad other traditions. Um, and then there's non-ordinary states of consciousness which can be achieved in many ways. Um, 
from meditation to psychedelics and uh, shamanic work and whatever. And then the last one that I'll uh, mention here, that's kind of like the big bulk. Everybody who's talking about reincarnation is aware of that uh, compilation of Ian Stevenson, um, who was just has a very large um, uh, compilation of, of children who have either memory of past life experiences or um, birthmarks that correspond with lives that are, are no longer present um, or no languages. And there's all kinds of uh, evidence. Um, and, and this, I'll just make a side note. I won't get into it too much, but uh, if you would like to ask me later in the question section, I will provide more information about what is unique about these uh, children, why do they remember the past lives and we don't, um, suggesting that it's an anomaly and, um, and uh, yeah, we'll get to it if, 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 if uh, we'll get to it. So um, I'll start by defining some key terms that not necessarily everybody are aware of. Um, the first is the Akashic field. People know about the Akashic field or think they know about it a little bit? So a little bit of uh, awareness about that. So the idea of Akasha is uh, coming from Sanskrit, is, is coming together with the idea of Prana. Akasha came prior to Prana. Akasha is the underlying um, field that is more subtle or more implicit than reality, which is explicit. So Prana is the idea of everything that is in the manifest universe. Either, you know, now it's being called Prana, like Chi and breath or whatever. It's uh, the subtle energies, but Prana also matters, condensed Prana, seen in, in ancient Sanskrit. And um, Akasha is the dynamic that uh, was here before prana. So, uh, and all prana kind of arises in the, to the manifest universe, plays some function and returns to the Akasha. So that's where the term Akasha came from. And then when Laszlo uses it, he's talking about the underlying vacuum. Or um, I wrote here rather plenum, um, because vacuum uh, is a general term to talk about the quantum field that is underlying reality, but actually uh, he's mentioning it's not at all empty like you would think a vacuum is. It's actually very, 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 very full. Um, so he calls it a plenum, or he calls it the divine plenum, kind of uh, <coughs> spirituality and science. Um, Wheeler, uh, one of the scientists that has been uh, mentioned in our class many times, he's uh, measured the density of the quantum field or the space inside the atom, the 99.99999% of, uh, that is the actual atom other than stuff. So he measured the, the density of that nothingness and it, it turned out to be a, a quantumly big number, uh, 10 to the 96 or something grams per centimeters cube. Um, don't hold me to that number exactly, but something is completely crazy. And so the idea that the Akashic field is filled with information or memory of everything that could or did or would exist in the universe. And like Don mentioned in the numbers section when we talked about numbers, <coughs> there is enough, in, a, in very big numbers, there is enough uh, to hold all, all probability. <coughs> Sorry. So uh, just uh, three quick things. Uh, just examples of how um, Talking about the idea of Akashic field, that uh, our, the underlying field of our universe is retaining memory of previous cycles, um, how that, what, what that explains to us, or helps explain, is one is the coherence across uh, vast distances of space in our universe, um, two, uh, the statistically improbable initial conditions for our universe to go on this fruitful journey, um, such as Planck constant, or the speed of light, or the fact that the proton and the electron are you know, the same charge to the 25th decimal point or whatever, or just positive and negative. This is very um, precise initial conditions, and you would say, what's the, what's the chances of that happening? So if you incorporate the idea of Akashic field, well, that's not the first time that the universe has incarnated, and so it's building upon memory of past attempts, and so increasing intelligence and adap ad adaptation as, as uh, evolution of the universe. And three, it gives, it, it gives us a framework to understand or honor um, everything that Victoria has talked about, basically transpersonal or paranormal phenomena, because there is this mind, the universal mind that is um, alive in a way or retains memory and can be accessed in any, any time. So that's the idea of Akashic field, and I'm going to differentiate that from the idea of soul, and that's the whole idea of the article that I read. So soul uh, is defined in this article by the, as, as the reincarnating spiritual entity um, that is integrating lessons across incarnations. Um, 
of multiple lives or personalities that go through the space-time school. So this is kind of like set um, language that refers to space-time or this physical reality at a school and the personality is kind of going through the school to learn particular lessons and the soul is behind everything and, um, and doesn't really enter the manifest or the samsara maya of this world but uh, the personality is, so the soul is what the one that's integrating all the lessons. So the main idea of this article has been to ask, um, does the soul, does the idea of soul even need it? And is, not, is it not redundant when you think about a larger concept such as the Akashic field? Because uh, Urban Lando in his book, uh, Science in the Akashic Field, which I recommend, said uh, all reincarnation phenomena, which he, which he doesn't negate, he, he, said he definitely sees the phenomena as real, like uh, Ian Stevenson's work and so on, the kids who remember their past lives. Uh, he's asking, um, or he's saying all reincarnation phenomena that we see can be attributed to interaction with the Akashic field, and you don't necessarily need an intermediate state of soul uh, to explain these things. It's not, don't take it personally, he said. And uh, Bach says, um, which is the author of this article, he's, he, um, he says that that's uh, ontological simplicity, that there's a little, um, so it's, there might, there might be more, it might, he agrees that the idea of Akasha might be uh, beyond the idea of soul, but he doesn't, that doesn't mean that the idea of soul is not in existence. And um, I have here a few, uh, if you'll see in the does the Akashic field, does the Akashic field make soul concept redundant? I have here three um, reasons or four reasons why it's uh, not. And I, uh, I'll just go run through them really fast or because I actually want to add another thing that uh, is my take on so, um, which I, I'm not sure if I'll have time if I'll uh, read all these, but I'll, I'll just mention uh, the important ones because I don't agree necessarily with everything that Bob says in this section about the soul. So I thought about like, mentioning it. Um, so the idea is uh, that specific past life, mem people have specific past life memories rather than just random ones. Past life memories that are related to them. So he's asking, well, why? Why would they have that specific one? Uh, the Akashic field won't ex doesn't explain that, as if there is uh, some sort of coherence in our life. Um, again, that's not uh, exactly, th this section of the article was a little bit uh, disoriented, logically, I would say. Um, <coughs> he's talking about the variation of human individuality um, as something like every person is evolving both psychologi psychologically and physiologically. And uh, that explains to him, at least it, it, it makes a necessity to an, an idea similar to a soul that is incarnating. Um, he's saying then that the third and the fourth I really agree with. He's saying it's very important to see reality from the time, the deep time eyes. Just expands our idea of identity or self uh, well beyond this life story. And that's uh, always a good thing. Um, or at least it's important, it's possible. And so we should try it. And then the fourth is that, um, um, it brings back the idea of personal responsibility that the Akashic field doesn't necessarily touch upon because if everything is kind of already interconnected and everything is anyway returning to the Akasha, which we'll get soon to the, to the uh, dynamics of the Akasha, um, well, the Akasha doesn't have a need for me to take responsibility right now and the idea of soul and reincarnation does bring that uh, concept, responsibility and accountability because uh, there is karma and we'll talk about how karma might be. Um, manifested. Uh, so I'll just add real quick my idea about soul, which is from uh, the book, not the article. Um, it does the idea. This is Stanislav Grof's word. That's a coex, C O E X. It uh, uh, stands for condensed experiences. And so, uh, rather than um, so, the idea is that there are throughout time and space there are lessons to be learned, and I am connected to the lessons that are. I'm I'm most I feel most close or similar to. The, those psychic lessons that are being learned in time. So I'm, for example, dealing with healing my hands right now in this incarnation very much. I'm connected to all the beings ever that has dealt with something similar to that. Sure. And that is more, uh, so that is already kind of a, a better uh, model than I am just, um, you know, the momentum from the past, to, from the guy that just died a moment before I started this. So, but we'll get to refining the terms. Um, he says, he says not only does it uh, not make the soul redundant, um, 
the Akashic, the term of Akashic field actually is resonating very much and corresponding with the idea of reincarnation and so, and for uh, Bach it actually helps um, understand the, the, the dynamics of how reincarnation works. Well, when he takes the model that uh, Laszlo uh, offers about how the Akasha turns into Prana or the metaverse into universe and, and back, that helps him uh, understand how uh, reincarnation or soul and life interact. So yeah, metaverse um, is the idea of something bigger than the universe that gives birth to our universe and is um, kind of beyond that. Uh, is used by Laszlo sometimes interchangeably as the Akashic field, just because these two terms are way beyond what we can conceptualize, uh, but they're not necessarily the same. So how does the metaverse universe dynamic illuminate the reincarnation process? Well, one is a very, very macro process, one is a more micro process, but they're the same dynamic. And it's interesting just to notice uh, the, the metaphors that are used in this article, such as digesting and giving birth to. So the metaverse or Akasha gives birth to uh, universes which uh, go through experiences, gain learnings, and then return to the Akasha and imprinting uh, again and again up, up, up onto the Akasha itself uh, all the learnings, and then the Akasha is the actual learning entity that is growing and changing, but it does not participate in the manifest reality. Um, similarly, um, the soul is ever present, light is the one that is going, gaining experiences, personality, or the little I returns to uh, the soul either at death or in multiple times throughout life and the soul is the one that is gathering, digesting the information and uh, turning on, onward uh, into more cycles. So just digesting information or stuff like that um, by the soul and by the Akasha is, uh, is, is just how, how that helps him understand. Hmm. So. <coughs> Um, the idea of a soul, I, I broke it down here uh, below, or kind of in the middle of the page, to three terms that I find uh, are corresponding, only kind of different uh, sizes, but they're all uh, should be seen in the left quadrants of Wilbur's map, four quadrants, so uh, both the term soul, morphogenetic field, and Akashic field are all uh, things without simple location. They are not really existing in the manifest universe, there, they have no atoms per se, but they are, uh, you know, existing. And so I just want to offer that they're kind of like holistically uh, nested within each other. The soul being the, the what we said, the ever-present entity uh, or witness that is underlying uh, the reality of the cycles of life and the, of personalities. Then the morphogenetic field is a little larger. It's also a wise entity by itself, but it uh, it is integrating and digesting the learnings of whole species or, or species mind or self-similar groups um, throughout um, incarnation as well. And the idea of Akashic field, which is kind of bigger and has, takes a pretty big expansion of the mind to start to envision, is um, just the, the thing that receives the universe after it will return um, to the big crunch and then will give rise to a new big bang, perhaps, if that's the model that we should see universes coming to being with. So just to me, help understand just like uh, these three terms in terms of one another similarly. Uh, I'm gonna go now to talk about how um, Bach offers ways we can shift the paradigm. Um, that is incorporating new metaphors from uh, the advancements of science into our language and conceptualizations of, uh, of these processes. So the Newtonian, which everybody is dissing on Newton these days, I'll be also one of them. Um, <laughs> it won't, so something like, uh, the Newtonian sees something like a separate atomistic-like soul, that is, my, I have a soul, it's in my heart, or it's in my pineal gland, or whatever. Um, and that soul that resides in me, it's kind of like one thing, um, is gonna bounce around when I die, and uh, it's gonna, its energy is gonna um, affect the karma of the next life, in a linear order, or and, and the causal order. Um, holonomic, which is the word used by Laszlo, which is probably so tired of just inventing new words. Uh, holonomic meaning everything, you know, everything nonlinear, everything uh, possible, um, transpersonal, um, quantum, and so on. Uh, just the new sciences, perhaps. Um, we might talk more about the holographic soul, um, a quantum-like process rather than a thing. 
that is existing simultaneously in multiple times. That is just like a very different view already. Um, so here are a few linguistics expressions for John, yeah. uh, <laughs> the, the, the language guy. Um, you might hear somebody saying in the grocery shop, um, a soul moves from life to life. That's like, uh, you know, not, it's not uncommon to imagine somebody thinking that way if he's, think, if he's already thinking about uh, life beyond death. So saying something like the soul moves from life to life is kind of like saying the, the metaverse is moving from universe to universe, if you're using that analogy that helped Bach before. So kind of silly. Uh, more um, appropriate might be to say um, each life imprints upon the soul, which digests and then informs the life, but does not collapse, collapse into it. So just like the metaverse is not interacting with the universe, it's ever present behind it, so does the soul, it's not, it does not, it, it's not interacting with daily life, it's ever present as, a, as the witness, but it's not interacting, it's not, uh, um, uh, so, so another linguistic uh, expression that you might hear, karma affect, affects me personally and operates in causality. So I am basically the, the, the victim of the guy that just went before me. <laughs> it was like, you know, I, I just happened to be born after Hitler. I just, you know, I have a very hard life. And, um, so again, expanding on the idea of uh, nonlinear time and the idea of transpersonal, trans, transpersonality. Uh, karma involves both collective lessons, the species mind, like, happening to come through me, and personal lesson, uh, so both M, but either way they're registered non-locally non and in non-linear time. So that again brings back the idea of responsibility and accountability um, because it, it's a real precious opportunity actually to advance the, the evolution of, of, of the entire process uh, if I see it that way and I can affect both the ancient past and the ancient future. Um, by my actions now, so it's, it's not at all about, you know, uh, where, because it, it's not causal necessarily. So these are just, uh, again, just, this is just theories and stuff like that, even though a lot of it is based on people's personal experience of uh, non ordinary states. Um, so that's it about shifting the paradigm so far. Uh, I want to take now a quick tangent. Um, and that's because when you consider uh, I, I want to make a point that is the, a lot of the information that people have about the afterlife uh, world or universe or the post-mortem world, world that's what it's called, um, the, the, the view is very limited. Um, for example, Ian Stevenson's work is said to be paradoxically both, adva both advancing the, the field because now um, kind of like uh, that Hutz woman, Hutz, um, you, you can't argue with these evidence. Uh, you can't say that there is nothing like the phenomena of reincarnation because um, obviously there is something. Uh, but at the same time that it advances the field, it also restricts our imagination of the field because it's a very special case of reincarnation that is causal most of the time, uh, similar in time and in space and so on. And so these are special cases. Um, the idea is not to mistake information uh, from lower bardos, which I'll define the term soon, um, to represent the entirety of what is beyond space time. So, um, this is the idea of personal immortality, and that is, it is a tragedy, according to the traditions of uh, Buddhists, for example, the Buddhist tradition. Um, and why is that? Is because if somebody is after, is died already, and they still keep coming back to the physical world and still attached to his personality, then uh, I don't necessarily, you know, the fact that he's ascended doesn't mean that he's an ascended master and not all information that is given to me from uh, somebody or, or given to somebody from, uh, from an afterlife doesn't mean that they are completely enlightened and in touch with God. So just uh, making a differentiation here that non-living doesn't mean one thing. There might be a lot of um, uh, bardos or states in there. And for that, I'm gonna go away from the article and because uh, this is Robert Monroe, uh, who started the Monroe Institute, who's been dealing with out-of-body experiences and wrote three books about this far journey, this is uh, the one I have. Um, and um, Bach loves him and has a whole uh, chapter in his book mentioned about him. 
And I just want, because my, my personal belief system about the uh, life after death, it looks like something like this. So I'm going to just describe what uh, Robert Monroe offers as the four spheres that are surrounding space time, or the four, four rings or spheres uh, of afterlife. So he says, afterlife, um, on the very first level, most close to non to space time reality, there is persons who died and don't know that they died. And so they're kind of completely um, fixated on physical reality. And uh, that might be because of strong physical or psychological addictions at time of death, or very low um, level of spiritual maturity at time of death, or uh, a very tragic death. Uh, but in either way, they're kind of like uh, what Wagner calls uh, in dream, in code dreaming people that are not accessible or looking like they're drunk in the dream. So you can't even call their name, they, they're completely in their own zone. So that's these people, and he says they're attributing for a lot of the uh, paranormal phenomena that people experience. Um, it's all interacting with these people who basically don't know what they're doing and, and kind of like just, just drunk and um, making a mess, and they're kind of like half in physical reality and half not. Um, the second ring, uh, I'll move through this quickly. Uh, the second ring are people who know that they died people, the entities. Aware, points of awareness that are uh, uh, dead, but they don't know that they, they know that they died, but they don't have any imagination of what else is possible, basically. So they're kind of like stuck. Um, they've completely fixated on the life they just finished. Uh, they have greater awareness, but they're just, they don't continue on. Um, and, but, but he says that this ring is a lot smaller because there's a big turnover there, because as opposed to the first ring, these people are able to receive uh, guidance um, from higher rings, or from people like him, or Ed Kellogg, who claims to help people move forward in the lucid dream state. Um, the third ring is just a vast, vast, infinite realm of countless uh, co-created realities, based on the principle of like attracts like, and it's just uh, basically, um, Monroe said that it, it, it will take a thousand incarnations to just start to explore the field of what is possible. So it's everything, I imagine it as, you know, everything can possibly imagine there is. Um, and he, he just makes the distinction, it's, it's beautiful uh, descriptions in the book, um, but he makes the distinction at one point, at least one distinction, that some of these realities, clusters of realities, are, and, and they're all dynamic, it's not like they're fixed, so it's like a whole different reality that's a little bit outside of space-time somehow, and, um, and it goes, um, the realities move from being more physically oriented and separation oriented and personality and kind of their structure is like that, to uh, um, more towards uh, being non-physical oriented and just all times become one timelessness kind of uh, blur and all uh, lights merge into pure light um, and just all boundaries dissolve. So that's still the third realm. There are many realities that are just living and dynamically like that. And then the fourth realm, which is beautiful, is like uh, the first and last time, or as he calls it, it's kind of like a stepping stone before you enter the source or just coming from the source to your first, very first incarnation. Um, just with pure intentions as a soul or whatever, um, which is just interesting to think about. And there's a beautiful quote that I like here. He says, where they go can only be known by those who can follow them. So that's all I did. Uh, this tangent was just to kind of expand the mind uh, to what is possible after death and to make the point, don't mistake information from lower bardos, which are in between states. These are bardos. Uh, to represent the entirety of what is beyond space-time. So there might be a lot more than what we, uh, than what is uh, currently available. Um, and, and definitely ineffable things. Oh, I'm right on time, it's perfect. Um, <laughs> does the soul endure with coherence? Uh, that's basically the second biggest question that this article has asked. And that is, uh, if there is a soul, does it remain beyond space-time? Or does it survive the big crunch? Which is a kind of a theoretical question to ask, because we don't even know that there will be the end. Of, it's, it's, uh, we don't know anything about how to answer this question, but still, this question was asked because uh, it is theoretically important. And Laszlo says uh, very definitely no. And that is uh, very corresponding, uh, or corresponding with the Vedantic view of Buddhism. And that is this, um, the soul, if there is a soul, then it is like anything else in the manifest universe. And anything in the manifest universe comes into being from the Akasha <coughs> and returns to the Akasha and has no what is called sunyata. Sunyata is a term in Buddhism to mean empty of self-existence, or uh, we talked about that, emptiness or whatever. 
So everything in the manifest universe, whether that is a universe that is very long in time and big in space, or a lifetime that is just 90 years, or like an apple that is just like four years, or an idea that is just a moment, all of these things uh, have in similar that they don't have um, inherent self-existence, uh, and they will all merge back into the akasha, making their imprint, but just dissolving. Um, and only their memory retains in the akasha field. Um, Laszlo, uh, or Christopher Bach, um, from personal experience in the non-ordinary states, he has a very strong uh, confidence. That is, he, he could not be convinced otherwise because he's so sure of that experience, that there is a soul and that this, there is a stage of the soul that is enduring beyond space-time. And not only that, he says um, that soul, which is a merging of uh, uh, both personal and cosmic um, consciousness, that individuality, uh, the higher form of individuality, is actually one of the reasons for the entire evolutionary process of the universe in the first place. So that's, he's kind of making a big claim here, but, that, but that's his personal belief very strongly. <coughs> um, the, the Tao, uh, he, he quotes the Tao there, I don't know if it's, he says the Tao, I don't know if he's, I haven't read it in the Tao Te Ching, but perhaps there are more um, written essays about the Tao. But anyway, the idea that individuality truly does not exist until the moment of awakening. So until, so he says it's true individuality, what you refer to as the soul, if you're misconceptualizing it, nothing stays and everything dissolves uh, into the Akasha. But if you are awakened and there is a true individuality, um, um, then that, that does endure beyond space-time. And um, until that moment, there are no structures in the psyche that are strong enough to withhold or uh, withstand the, the um, full immersion into the one after death. So it's just like um, merging in with divine unity is where we're going to. And if you are um, not completely awake to your nature before that, then it's completely overwhelming. And, um, and that is why uh, it is possible, but it is very rare. Um, and to his idea, the point of spiritual practice. So here I have just uh, Stanislav Grof, which is kind of like his, his man. Um, quote by Stanislav Grof from uh, one of his journeys, um, a cosmic diamond consciousness. Within it is everything intelligent and creative in the universe. I am a dimensionless point of awareness, totally dissolved, yet maintained in a sense of unique separateness. So to me, I have an imagination of a drop of water inside the ocean that <coughs> knows it to be the entire ocean nature and also knows it to be something very unique and special while it is just floating, dissolved in the water. Um, which brings me basically to um, the most important point, which is the idea of integrated transcendence. Um, hmm. It is um, with spiritual practice, abiding as the self, as uh, Ramana Maharshi would say, the Ken Wilber quotes, um, abiding as the self while we are alive will gain us the confidence and the coherence um, to withstand uh, whatever comes after life and remain in coherence. And then instead of um, dropping our individuality and personality in spiritual practice, like is advocated by some spiritual traditions, like ascend to nirvana, just drop everything down, just dissolve, um, yeah, dissolve, but uh, keep what is unique about you because individuality is a gift and um, and it is precious and we are we have an opportunity to inform the Akasha um, about what what is our unique perspective of, of the universe and so um, I will recap real quick what the journey that I've just taken um, we went I just kind of introduced <coughs> some key figures um, that have been uh, learning about introducing the Akashic field introducing the idea of soul and making the point that the soul um, is not redundant because of the Akashic field, but is actually still necessary or might be necessary for greater detailed understanding of the mechanics of life and death. Um, I kind of saw that there is a morphogenetic field there in the middle as well. Um, some <coughs> might be a species mind, kind of one foot in the individuality and one foot in the uh, collective infinity. Um, gave some suggestions gave some suggestions to, uh, to advance um, our lingo expressions, just talking about the soul from a more quantum process point of view in nonlinear time, 
affecting karma in non-localities um, as opposed to um, being this atomistic-like thing that moves in causality from life to life and uh, is a victim of karma. Um, then I just, we took a quick journey um, out of body with uh, Robert Monroe to explore some, uh, some of his uh, <coughs> personal experiences of the Bardo states and uh, just expanded our imagination of what is possible after life. And then um, we returned to ask, does the soul re um, remain after life with coherence? And uh, Lazo says no, like the Vedantic view, because everything is empty. And Bach says yes, with a strong inclination of his personal experience in an ordinary state to know that there is a, a higher state of individuality or an oversoul um, that is part of the process itself and one of the purposes of the process of evolution. And so he says, um, let us die as the hottest story in the universe. talking about little kids that may exhibit signs that it may appear that they are reincarnate, but then no longer exhibit those signs. Like, for instance, as the family said, when I was two, I just burst out and spoke as if I was fully aged and then never did it again. But it seems as though now, uh, when I look at manifestations, what I'm starting to do, is, you know, things are starting to become apparent. But does it talk anything about the little kids that Maybe act like. Well, it, do, it doesn't, because I haven't read the research itself about Ian Stevenson's, I just read references to it. But what it makes me think is what you are talking about, actually, about the difference between repressing emotions or, you know, way, things that are inside of you versus, uh, I forget the words that you use. Dissociating. Yeah, either dissociating or repressing. But like, oh, so one thing could be you expressed it and you gave it life and that's what's always needed. That soul just needs another shout out and it wasn't done, or, uh, so that's why you haven't seen it since, or it was repressed, either by you not feeling that it's appropriate, and so just like leaving it as some point, uh, you know, that's what I think. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Kind of going off of what they both were speaking of, do you um, personally, or was there anything in about, yeah, sort of what the um, meaning or reason for the, um, the person, if there's sort of meaning to the experience, sort of what the meaning is for um, this carrying on to the next life, or what do you think might be the need or the meaning why, behind it? Why, why do kids why remember they, the past lives? Is that the question? Yeah, I mean, if there's you know a reason for if it's so powerful mm -hmm. that the de you know the death was so traumatic or that it carried over. Um, think it might be needed to happen to sort of heal that or, mm -hmm. or to continue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
I, I, I just know that there is like the normal state is that there is a profound forgetting in every life, kind of like most of our dreams are forget, we forget. Um, and it's the anomaly, even though it is true that with advanced spirituality, people report a lot of you know interactions with other states of existence and uh, other things. Uh, but I don't know, this is just like for us to speculate. Yeah. Can you refresh me on why <coughs> personal immortality is a problem? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, the idea of Buddhism says that you know one of the three main concepts of Buddhism is anatta, that there is no self, and the idea of self is an illusion. And so, if what you know when, when it says personal immortality, it refers to like your personality. If your personality, which is the thing that in spiritual practice you're trying to like not live out of, right. if that carries with you after death, then that, that's right. Whereas right. if even death is not um, an escape from from samsara, then um, then that's tragedy. That makes sense with the the Tao and individuality. Exactly. So so the Tao talks still talks about. So he's saying, after death you might continue as if your if your awareness is the soul. If your awareness is the soul, then that's what the Tao calls individuality after awakening. Um, but if you're identifying with the smaller self, then when you die, those structures are not strong enough or coherent enough to withstand the entirety of the cosmos. Yeah. I guess I'm trying to wrap my head around uh, non-linear time and uh, people remembering past lives as they were in the past and not this like collective thing. Do you think it has anything to do with uh, them perhaps all happening kind of at once in different times and just like every incarnation on uh, uh, every manifest incarnation kind of just like coming to a point of this lesson that needs to learn but like since we are stuck in this uh, linear framework or So I'm in touch with everything in the universe in the past, present, and future. That is might be one time, that one moment, ever present in some sort of wider perspective. All of these are going through uh, moments that you know life is not linear, so it looks like kind of a curve of, uh, of heartbeat. And uh, like neurons that fire together, they wire together or whatever. I feel like perhaps if I'm having a very intense moment of awakening or liberation of a great learning is le lesson is learned in my coax, then it might be just um, um, like Michael's kind of a coherent, uh, it might be, uh, I forget the name, but uh, yeah, yeah, in training, uh, in training with all those, you know, so a spike might be in training, and so uh, perhaps, it, you know, it's very hard to imagine, but I, I'm like you, when I imagine non-linear time, I imagine it to be just one moment, um, even though there's a idea of multiple probabilities. Yeah, one more question. question. One more question. Simple. One more question. Mm -hmm. Let me ask it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, this will be quick. I can't anticipate this because we have to wait one minute to answer. Uh, Laszlo, tell me more about Laszlo in this sense. Bosch seems like he's a first person experimentalist with states of consciousness, etc. From what you said, it sounds like Laszlo is more of a third person theorist. Um, yeah, Laszlo is, uh, is a scientist who loves to think about his, uh, his findings and, and brings and, and make uh, um, models that are uh, that make sense to him. And he and his mind is not constricted so much, so he's, he has like a pretty nice idea about how the universe works from all his findings. But it's not so much like personal engagement with uh, reality in non-ordinary states. So. Okay, thanks. Yeah.